My name is Jeff, and I'm 21 years old. I'm studying medicine in university, and I made some good friends there. One of them, George, is particularly wealthy, or better said, his family is. And so, a few months ago, during summer, when we were enjoying our well-deserved vacations, George invited me and two more friends of ours, also students from med school, Ronald and Nicholas. In spite what you might be thinking, George didn't invite us to some kind of exotic beach paradise, popular among tourists. In fact, we were going to spend two weeks in Scotland. Where? In a castle that George's father bought and also paid heavy bucks to have it restored. My father wants to turn the castle into a hotel. Lots of people are into those historical buildings, and some of them have tons of money to spend, George said when he invited us during dinner at his house. Great idea. No wonder your family is so wealthy and successful, I answered. Yep, you have to keep the money busy. Money is like a living creature. If you get it to reproduce, you will benefit from it, George said. Well, it's definitely something different. The Scottish castle, hey, I'm in, Ronald answered. Thanks for the invitation, George. I look forward to this. Plus, I'm not fond of high temperatures, so it'll be nice. Scotland is not so hot, not even during summer. Nicholas was excited. And so was I. In late August, we flew to Scotland. There, an employee belonging to George's father was waiting for us. He drove us to the castle. It was magnificent and huge. Built on top of a hill like many medieval castles for protection and also to better see the surroundings, there were no neighbors nearby. The employee named Peter showed us a section of the castle that was turned into a garage. There, another car was available to us so we could drive to the nearest town whenever we wanted. That was great. We weren't going to be completely isolated. In any case, you can see that the house is ready to welcome you. Lots of food available in the kitchen, and quality-aged Scottish whiskey as well. Also, several brands of beer, Peter said, as he gave us a tour around the castle. The castle looked great. It kept that old magic and decoration, but with lots of modern touches, like furniture and TV. There were lots of rooms with splendid view as I expected. I specifically loved one of the balconies. Wow, look at this. The view is absolutely breathtaking, I said. I'll say, this will be a great place to relax, talk, and have a few cold ones. My dad did good and tasteful business, George said. And I couldn't agree more. The first two days were great. We explored the natural surroundings and played soccer. During nights, we saw TV and also enjoyed in the balcony. But during the third day, I woke up and heard one of my friends screaming. I got out of the bed. George and Nicholas obviously heard the same noise because they woke up too as I met them outside our bedrooms. We heard more screams. It was Ronald who was still in his bedroom. We went there as fast as we could. When we opened the door and switched on the lights, we saw a bizarre and bloody scenario. Ronald was pulling out his own hair Please, make it stop. I can't control myself and the voices in my head. He shouted. Holy shit, what are you doing, man? It's like something took control of my body. Help me. I managed to grab Ronald's hands, which prevented him from pulling off more hair. But there was already a big and nasty bald spot on his head. I had to tie him down with one of the bed sheets because Ronald was now trying to hit me and grab me always claiming that he wasn't in control of his own actions. We have to call the emergency, Nicholas shouted. No problem, I have the emergency's local number on my cell phone. Damn, I can't get a connection. I'm gonna go outside, said George. Hurry up, dude, I said to George as he ran downstairs. What the hell is happening to me? Ronald asked desperately. I don't know, you're having a psychotic episode. Doctors will know what to do, I hope. I answered. I'm going to get you a glass of water, said Nicholas. Minutes went by, and neither Nicholas or George returned. I went to see why. To make a phone call and to fetch a glass of water doesn't take that long. Of course, I assumed Nicholas was in the kitchen, and I was right. Nicholas, you too? I shouted as I saw my friend scratching his face aggressively. He was already bleeding, both his cheeks and his forehead. I, I, I can't help it. I went to get a rope, and fortunately there were a few of them, and I tied up Nicholas as well. It wasn't easy as he tried to resist. Like Ronald, Nicholas claimed that he wasn't controlling his movements, 
I threw a bucket of water on him, which gave me the opportunity to calm him down. He was now on the floor, hands and feet completely immobilized. It was one of those rare occasions in which someone in that situation was actually thankful. I was literally saving Nicholas and Ronald from themselves. Okay, this is starting to get weird. I'm going to check on George, I said to Nicholas. George was still outside. His eyes were shining. He looked and sounded different. George was holding his shaving razor in his hands. Hello. Your name is Jeff, right? I thought you'd never come. Saving the other idiots, right? But not for long, he said with a cold smile. Who are you? I asked, knowing for some reason that it couldn't be George. Ah, smart, aren't you? I'm the ghost of this castle. I have lived here for centuries. No one has been here for a long time, and I've finally got the opportunity to find some hosts. I was a murderer before I was sentenced to death for my crimes, right in this castle. And now, I plan on keep doing what I do best. George said as he started chasing me. Fortunately, Ghost George was out of practice when it came to mundane and physical movements. On the other hand, my own adrenaline was helpful as I was fighting for my own life. I managed to kick the razor away from George's hand. I punched him in the face as hard as I could, and he lost his senses. Sorry, man, but it's for the best. Then, I put George, Nicholas, and Ronald in the car and drove away from that creepy castle as fast as I could. I only stopped at the airport. As the castle was left behind, my friends regained control of their movements, and George was himself again when he woke up. We took the first flight available back to the US. Later on, we did confirm the story that, indeed, a murderer was hanged to death in that castle. George's father let go of the idea of opening the hotel. So, for a long time, the castle will keep being an abandoned place, regardless who or what haunts those halls. On the day I was attacked, I shouldn't have ever been at Clovis. I should have been safe and sound in my house. There wasn't even anything in particular that I needed to buy. The only reason I went there was to get out of the house. My husband Jerry had been arrested three weeks ago. He was an investor who defrauded his clients. He'd swindled people out of millions of dollars, and the law had finally caught up with him. I had no idea what he was doing at the time, but his lawyer still advised me to stay away from the public for a while, because a lot of people in my town blamed me as much as they blamed my husband. I was the rich, oblivious housewife who still got to live in a mansion while so many of them were out on the street. It wasn't fair. I didn't do anything wrong, but people still hated me anyway. For three long weeks, I did what the lawyers said. I stayed inside and had food delivered, but one day, I was overcome with cabin fever and I needed to get out of the house. I figured that if I were just to pop into Kroger and buy some snacks and wine, that nothing bad would happen. I'd wear sunglasses and a hat so no one would recognize me. I was very wrong. As soon as I entered the store, I could feel all eyes on me. Everyone was staring. I didn't recognize anyone because I didn't have a lot of local friends, especially people in this tax bracket. But they sure recognized me. My husband had been in a few news stops, and they'd used a lot of photos with the both of us together. So I guess my face was pretty famous. And I think that the hat and sunglass combo was a bad idea. They think they just made me more conspicuous. I walked to the alcohol section, which where's where I really wanted to go anyway, and I filled my cart with wine bottles. Only the expensive stuff, of course. I was minding my own business when I got to the end of the aisle. Two older women stopped me, standing in my way and glaring at me through their thick glasses. They looked like angry librarians. Excuse me. I said as I tried to push through, but they wouldn't move. You're his wife, one of the women said. I'm just here to shop, I told her. Yeah, the other woman said. You're shopping with the money you stole from our families. I didn't steal anything, I said. 
I had no idea my husband would. Shut up, the woman said. Her eyes were filled with pure hatred. I realized that the women weren't going to move, so I started backing away. But several other people were waiting on the other end of the aisle. I was blocked off from both directions. What were they going to do? They were starting to get closer. I was worried that this was going to turn into a real mob. A riot. Another shopper, a young attractive woman in a sunflower dress, pushed her way through the crowd and walked right up to me. I felt relieved. It seemed like she was trying to defuse the situation. She didn't look angry like everyone else. She smiled sympathetically at me, but when she got close enough, she spat right in my face. I had enough. This whole situation was becoming humiliating and dangerous. I left my shopping cart where it was and literally ran through the crowd before they could grab me. I just had to get out of there. I raced towards my car when I heard a man's voice shouting, It's you! I would have ignored him, but then I heard a terrible scream and a loud thump. I had to turn. When I looked back towards the entrance, I saw the man lying unconscious on the ground. He was right next to a ladder. I realized with horror that he was at the top of the ladder fixing some kind of electrical problem when he saw me, got distracted, and fell over. I had to run over and see if he was okay. When I got to his body, I could tell that he was dead. The fall had killed him. His head was twisted in an unnatural direction. It looked like he'd landed on his neck. Oh God, I said. I fished out my phone to call 911 when the group of shoppers rushed through the entrance and saw me standing over the dead body. Look, one of them said. She killed him, another one said. She murdered Tony, and now she's taking pictures of his body. They had it all wrong. I didn't kill anyone, and I wasn't trying to take a picture. I, I, I was trying to call the hospital. I needed to defend myself. Please, no, he, he just fell. But no one was listening. They all stood by the entrance for a long moment, exchanging looks. And then they came to the exact same conclusion. Without saying anything, they knew what they were going to do. They were going to attack me all at once. As a unit, a horrible crazed unit, they all ran at me. I raced out of the parking lot. I realized that I was going in the opposite direction of my car, but I couldn't turn around. I had to keep running. They were getting closer and closer. I had my bicycle three times a week, so I was in very good shape. Much better shape than a lot of these people. Honestly, I made it to the end of the parking lot, and then to the other side of the sidewalk next to our town's main street. My house was a 20-minute drive away from here so I couldn't run all the way back. I had to find another place where I could stay and hide. I'd call the police and explain what happened, and surely they would understand. I needed protection, but where could I go? I looked around me and I saw an old yoga studio where I used to be a client, just a few minutes away. But if I could make it there and explain my situation to Nina, the owner, then maybe she could help me hide from the mob. So that's what I did. I ran as fast as I could until I made it to the yoga studio. I rushed inside, sweating and out of breath. I was so scared that these people would tear me apart if they even caught up to me. I saw a woman working the front desk, but it wasn't Nina. It was someone I'd never seen before. Um, hi, I said. Is, is Nina here? The woman looked at me for a long, silent second. I could tell she was trying to figure out who I was. Then she said, I'm the new owner. Nina lost all of her money because of your husband. I had to take over the business after she, well, after she killed herself. Oh, crap. I raced out of there, back onto the street. The mob of people had grown, and they were all rushing towards me. I had to find somewhere to go. So I went around the corner of the yoga studio 
and made it to a dead end alley. There was nowhere I could go except for a disgusting dumpster at the side of the alley. That was my only option. I had to hide inside and pray that no one would look. So before anyone ran to the corner, I jumped into the dumpster and slammed the lid over my head. I could hear their angry voices outside. I tried to hold my breath so they couldn't hear me. A few minutes passed and they were gone. I ended up waiting there in filth and total darkness for three hours before I finally felt safe enough to leave. Sore, humiliated, and covered in garbage, I got out of the dumpster and walked back to the Kroger parking lot. I passed a lot of people on my way to the car, but no one did anything. I guess they didn't recognize me under all this filth. I got in my car and drove home. Since then, I just stayed in my house, wondering what was going to happen with my life. Even if my husband gets acquitted for what he's done, the public will never accept us again. I'll have to stay in my house forever. My range of view was still affected by the rugged sunlight that had beaten my brows after five hours at the beach. Dark little patches and starry figures appeared on the corner of my vision, but I was happy I got gotten a tan on my second day at the summer resort, which I had chosen for vacation. It was a paradise in every way I could imagine, and I had begun to plan another visit to the resort for my next trip. I stood at the reception and waited for my key with which I could return to my room. The water from the beach called my attention. It was washing noises up the bank and down back into the sea. What remained of this was the wind from the ocean billowing into the alfresco reception, which was held in place by the wooden beams. I'm sorry, it's only going to take a moment, the receptionist said, a rural looking man with a stubbled beard. He smiled with his eyes and I returned with a gesture awkwardly, peeling my hair away from my face. He leaned over the counter and started tapping his finger on the desk and using his other hand to glide over the book in search of my name and my belongings, which had been brought from my room to the beachfront. His tappings soon turned rhythmic, and for a moment, I suspected he had become lost in the musicality. Gemma? he asked. I nodded. His grin turned fuller. He leaned away from the counter with all his presence. He shot one glance under the counter and provided my possessions wrapped in a cloth, I offered my word of gratitude as I picked up my clothes and received my keys to my room. The thoughts that occupied my mind had been of work and relaxation, nothing but those that I had failed to realize when I was being followed. I had gone into my room in the resort and had prepared for a shower when I heard someone knock on the door. It perplexed me because I didn't expect anyone to find me here. It was the summer holiday and I had three weeks of it for myself. Who's there? I asked. Johnny, he said at first. Realizing the consternation in my silence, he cleared his throat. From the reception, you forgot something. I felt the muscles in my head tick as I read myself mentally through the things I knew I had brought with me. I hesitated to open the door as I was still in towel. I'm coming in, he said. And there I was stupefied to silence in the summer heat when I heard the door to my room click open. The air stopped in my chest and a lump formed in my throat, swinging back and forth as oxygen pressed itself into my lungs involuntarily. I froze in place as sheer panic overcame me. He pushed the door with his shoulder and barged in. What the fuck are you doing? I cussed mustering up a fragile front of confidence. The breeze that whirled into the room came heated. It carried the smell of his skin and made my stomach churn. The rooms of the resort were large, but the pressure of our enclosed space kicked in. I could see the walls pull closer, wobbling unsteadily like animated figures. I started to pant in desperation. He noted my eyes and how I looked to the door. He smirked, I swallowed and twitched, 
because the hardened saliva that sank to my stomach hit painfully. I opened my mouth to cuss him out again, then I stopped. His hand went swiftly into his pocket and then out. He swiped his wrist and a pocket knife emerged from nothingness. The rays of sun that came into the house through the window frames caught the going of the steel and reflected it into my eyes. My knees rocked under the weight of my body. My bare toes on the ground clenched and my muscles spasmed. You comply with me and give me that, he warned, gesturing to my abdomen with the knife. I will let you leave peacefully if you do not comply. He swiped his blade across the empty air and the message was understood. He did not have to say it out loud. His fierce eyes betrayed its meaning well and purposefully. My life flashed before my eyes. I tightened my fingers up to gain control. Please, I begged him, stepping backwards as he approached with the knife, enclosing me in the corner. My life was all in his hands to decide, and like a manipulative predator, every step his feet took backed me into a corner. To my left of the door was the bathroom. I knew that stepping into the bathroom was damning his warning, but my mind was racing quicker than I could contain. I pleaded again and stepped even further backwards. Shh. His index fingers striped his lips. I'll put my knife in your stomach and pull out your guts like the others before you. Then I'll fuck your corpse. His words drew vividly in my mind, casting a gory scene that I knew was a possibility with the manner in which he held the knife. The stability of his gaze and the determination of each stride informed me that this was not his first. I turned to my left and in a flash dashed into the bathroom. I felt his breath coming down my neck, the closing gap between us. Then a smashing wind followed. The sensation was as though I had been pricked when his knife slashed my hand. The wound was shallow because I had dodged the focus of the blade, but it still bled. I screamed for help as far as my voice could carry me as I pushed my body to hold the door shut when he started to nudge it violently. The assuredness of my own existence hung by a thin thread and everything flashed by my eyes so fast. I sobbed and stared all around the bathroom for something to defend myself with. I found nothing. My eyes fell onto the bathtub and I imagined myself chopped up with his knife made to lay dead in that tub. I shook my head. I could tell when he moved away because the weight on the door was lighter. Suddenly, he was back, barging against the door. I staggered backwards. Please, I begged. His weight was gone again. I shut my eyes and counted my breath, desperate to surrender. If it meant a return to the more merciful death which he assured me, I pulled my weight off the door and pulled the door open. A strange thing happened because he ran too quickly with no impediment on his path. He jammed his way through and stumbled with a violent bang into the bathtub's face first. His body went limp. Much to my surprise, he was dead. The horror episode of my summer vacation was over as strangely as it had begun. My ashes. Take them to the most northern region of my homeland, the Isle of Man. Bury them. Protect them. Goodbye, Felix. January 1994, Tuesday at 12 p.m. That was the exact year, month, date, and time my mom passed from cancer. She had been fighting it for over four years with multiple cases of her verging on death, but never breaking the boundary. She was the only person who had ever cared for me after Dad died when I was still in the womb. And now she was gone. And nothing left but an urn filled with her ashes. After years and years devoted to raising me, nurturing me into an adult, I felt a duty to my mom to deliver her final wish, to be buried on the Isle of Man. The request seemed rather strange to me as... 
I had no recollection of why she would want her ashes left to rest there, but that was her wish, and I was going to see it through. I left early a couple weeks after she passed on a ferry that took me there in just a few hours. The trip was serene and calm. It felt as if nature guided my way to her grave. If only. I stepped onto the port of the northern territory of the isle, where the coastal village sat, overlooking the great expanse of water disconnecting it from mainland Britain. It took around 15 minutes for me to reach the peak of the hill, looking down upon the village. I thought that this would suit her, a resting place high above the world, reaching out its hands to the heavens where I knew she was watching me from. I missed her, and tears rolled down my cheeks unstoppably as I dug her grave. In moments, I had created a gap in the ground to store her remains, or rather preserve them for God's judgment, as I said my final goodbyes and walked towards the village to find somewhere to stay. The village was extremely quiet, with the only lit window being that of a local inn where I found a warm bed to rest in, for a rather unique price, if anything. Breaking away from the expensive hotels back in Portsmouth, the town I lived in at the time. As I lay in bed, I drifted off into a false reality of conscious that tricked my mind into thinking about the day that had passed. Looking back on the burial procedure, it was indeed odd that so many from the village had been stopping and gasping at the sight of me tearing a hole into some random hill that lay beside them. Yet, as I walked into the village, not a single head turned. How peculiar, I thought. These recent memories soon faded from my mind, and eventually I was submerged in sleep, and my mind found a new reality to live in for the short time I had escaped mine for. I woke abruptly the next morning to a loud bang. Someone had slammed my door. I sprung out of bed and sprinted over to it, flung it open to see a man, likely to be the one responsible, running down the hallway, down the stairs. Luckily, I had slept in my day clothes, and it took me mere moments to shove my feet into my shoes and trail the sicko to find out what he was doing in my room while I was asleep. I ran downstairs with haste, only to see him escape through the lobby door. I called for someone to stop him, but it must have been quite early in the morning, as there wasn't a single soul sitting on the sofas nor behind the counter. I took it upon myself to catch him, and I followed him through the door and out onto the street. The sun beamed its agonizing rays into my eyes as I exited the inn, exposing me to the fact that it was more along the lines of midday. This was strange to me. I had never woken up later than eight, even on the weekends. How on earth did I sleep until midday? I soon disregarded this thought as I saw the white outline of the same man sprinting into the doors of what appeared to be the village hall. Was he trying to hide from me? I swiftly made my way into that same building and carefully pushed open the doors, opening it up to a room filled to the brim with what seemed like the whole town dressed in white and blue cloaks. I froze in abject terror, and before I could close the doors to escape, I was dragged into the middle of the room by some men and was sent to my knees in front of a woman dressed in a quilted amethyst fabric with her hood covering her eyes. But holding in her hands was none other than my mom's urn, covered in dirt. What is this? I yelled. Do not speak. Now, open your ears. You have so much to hear. She spoke in a low, tenured vocal and was instantly enthralled to perk my ears to her words. Felix, you have finally been caught. We never intended for you to hear this, but the time has come. Years ago, when you were still in your mother's womb, she snapped one day. It was at our local school where she was teaching a class when something in her head broke down. She rampaged the entire room. Though all the children escaped, when your father came to see what was wrong, she drove a chair leg through his skull and smiled. We recognized her mental state was zombified in nature by the cancer. So we chose to banish her instead of doing this, which we should have done so long ago. This is what killers deserve, Felix. 
We do, however, recognize that you did not play a part in her evil. So we will let you leave. But let this be a warning to you, Felix. Never return. And with that, I was allowed to leave. My mind couldn't even fathom what had just happened. I used my lighter to give myself a cigarette as I locked the doors to the village hall behind me, using a plank of wood nearby. They were lying. My mom could never have done that. I then started to hold my lighter under the wooden planks lining the exterior to the building. They just destroyed my mom's final wish. How could they? The flames soon caught the wood, and in moments, the entire building was set ablaze. And if they wanted to treat some poor cancer patient's ashes with such brutal disrespect and lies, then they shall become ashes themselves. I watched as the building was finally engulfed in flames. Black plumes of smoke bellowed into the sky above, with screams echoing the void of shadow. They would all pay. Mom would be so proud. <laughs>